live from Copenhagen, Denmark. It's the Cube covering KubeCon and Cloud Native Con Europe 2018. Brought to you by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to the live coverage of theCUBE here in Copenhagen, Denmark for KubeCon, KubeCon, KubernetesCon 2018, part of the CNCF Cloud Native Compute Foundation, part of the Linux Foundation. I'm John Furrier with Lauren Cooney, the founder of Spark Labs. Breaking down day two, wrapping up our coverage of KubeCon and all the success that we've seen with Kubernetes. I thought it'd be really appropriate to bring on the co-founder of KubeCon originally, Joseph Jacks, known as JJ in the industry, good friend of theCUBE, and part of the early formation of what is now Cloud Native. We were all riffing on that at the time. Welcome back to theCUBE, great to see you. Thank you for having me, John. So, I mean, you know, for the story for the folks out there, you know, Cloud Native was um, really seen by the DevOps community, and infrastructure code was no secret to the insiders in the timeframes from 2010 through you know, 2015, 16 timeframe. But really, it was an OpenStack summit we, a lot of people were kind of like, hey, you know, Google's got Kubernetes, they're going to open it up, and this, uh, this is, could be a real game changer, container, Docker was flying off the shelves. So we kind of saw it, and you were there, and we were talking. So there was a group of us, you were one of them, and you founded KubeCon, and bolted it into the, at that time, the satellite Linux Foundation events, and then you, you passed it off as a good community citizen to the CNCF. So I wanted to just make sure that people knew that. Thank um, you. What a great success. What's your impression? I mean, are you blown away? What, you know, I am definitely blown away. I mean, I think the size and scale of the European audience is remarkable. Um, we had something like slightly less than half this in, in, um, in Austin last year. Uh, so to see you know, more than that uh, come here in, in, in Europe I think shows like the, the global kind of growth curve as well as like, I think Dan and someone else was asking sort of, raise your hand if you've been to you know, KubeCon Austin and very few actually. So there's a lot of new people yeah. showing up in Europe. Um, I think it just yeah. shows and the demand is huge. And Dan's been traveling around. I've seen him in China at some yep. events I've been to. All over. He's really working hard, so props yep. to him. We yep. gave him some, yep. some great, great props earlier. But he also told us Shanghai's coming online. Yeah. So you got Shanghai, you got Barcelona next year for the European show, and of course Seattle. This is a community celebrating right now because there's a lot of high fives going on right now yeah, because for sure. there's a lot of cool. We got some sort of core standard, de facto standard. Now let's go to work. Right. What are you working on now? You working on you got a stealth startup? Um, share a little bit. I know you don't want to give the details out, but. Where is it kind of above the stack? Uh, where are you going to be playing? Sure, so we're not, we're not talking too much um, uh, in, in terms of specifics and, and you know, we're, we're pretty stealthy, but I can tell you what I'm personally very excited about in, in terms of where Kubernetes is going and where this kind of ecosystem uh, is starting to mature for practitioners, for enterprises. So uh, one of the things that I think Kubernetes is starting to bring to bear is this idea of commoditizing distributed systems for everyday developers, for everyday enterprises. And I think that that is sort of the first time uh, in, in sort of maybe, maybe the history of, of, of software development, software engineering, and, and, and building applications, um, we're, we're, we're standardizing on a set of primitives, a set of like building blocks for distributed system style programming. Um, you know, we had, uh, you know, in, in, in previous eras, things like Erlang and um, you know, uh, fault tolerant programming and frameworks, but those were sort of like pocketed into different programming communities and different types of stacks. Yeah. I think Kubernetes is the one sort of horizontal yeah. technology that the industry is adopting and it's giving us these amazing properties. So um, I think w some of the things that we're focusing on and are excited about uh, involve sort of the programming layer on top of Kubernetes and simplifying the experience of kind of bringing all stateful and enterprise workloads and, and, and different types of uh, application paradigms natively into Kubernetes uh, without requiring a developer to really understand and learn the Kubernetes primitives themselves. That's next level infrastructure as code. Yeah, so, so as, as Kubernetes becomes more successful, as Kubernetes uh, succeeds um, at a larger and larger scale, people simply shouldn't have to know or understand the internals. Um, there's a lot of people, I think Kelsey and, and a few people 
um, started to talk about Kubernetes as the Linux kernel of distributed computing or distributed systems. And I think that's a really great way of looking at it. You know, do programmers you know, make file system calls directly when they're building their applications? Do they, do they, do they, do they uh, script directly against the kernel? You know, for, for maybe some very high performance yeah. things, but generally speaking, when you're writing a service or you're writing a microservice service or some business logic, you're writing at a higher level of abstraction in a language that's you know, doing some I.O. And, 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 and maybe some reading and writing files, but you're, you're, you're using yeah. higher level abstractions. That's, so I think by the same token, the focus today with Kubernetes is people are learning this, this API um, I think over time, people are, are going to be programming against that API at a higher level. And what, should, what are you doing here at the show? This, obviously you're a stealth star, so you're doing some market intelligence. Um, conversations you've been in, can you share your opinion of what's going on here? Your thoughts on the content program, the architecture, the I decisions think, they've made? I think, I think we've just, I mean, so lots of questions in there. Uh, I, what am I doing here? I, I just get so energized and, and I, I'm, I'm so, um, I just get reinvigorated kind of being here and, and talking to people and, and it's just super cool to see a lot of old faces, people who've been here for a while and uh, you know, one of the things that excites me and this is just like proof that the event's gotten so huge. I walk around and I see a lot of familiar faces but like more than 80, 90% of people have never seen before and I'm like, wow, this has like really gotten super huge mainstream. Um, talking with some customers, getting, getting a good sense of kind of what's going on. I think we've seen two really huge kind of trends come out of, out of the event. Um, one is this, this idea of multi-cloud sort of as a, as a focus area, and, and you, you, you know, you talk with Bassam at Upbound yeah. Yeah. And, and the sort of multi-cloud control plane mm -hmm. um, kind of need and demand out there in the, in the, in the, in the, com in the community, in the, in, the, in the user base. Um, I think what Bassam is doing is extremely exciting. Uh, the other, so multi-cloud is a really big paradigm that, that most companies are sort of prioritizing. You know, Kubernetes is available now on all the cloud providers, but how do, how do we actually adopt it in a way that is agnostic to any cloud provider service. That's one really big trend. The second big thing that I think we're starting to see just kind of across a lot of talks is taking the Kubernetes API and extending it and wrapping it around stateful applications and stateful workloads and being able to sort of program that API. Um, and so we saw, we saw the announcement from Red Hat on, on the operator framework. We've seen um, projects like Kube Builder and other things that are really about sort of building native custom Kubernetes APIs for your applications. Um, so extensibility, using the Kubernetes API as a building block, and then multi-cloud, I think those are really two huge trends um, happening here. What is your view on, I'm going to actually put you on a uh, test here. Sure. So Red Hat made a bet on Kubernetes yep. years ago when it was not obvious to a lot of the other big whales. Yep. You know, from the very got, beginning, really. Yeah, from the very beginning, yep. and that paid off huge for Red Hat as an example. Sure. So the question is, what bets should people be making? If you had to lay down some uh, uh, thought leadership on this here, because you obviously are, are in the middle of it and been part of the beginning, there's some bets to be made. What are the bets that the IBMs and the HPs and the Cisco's and the, the, the big players have to make, and what are the bets that the startups have to make? Well, yeah, there's two angles to that. I mean, I think the investments startups are making are, are, are a different um, set of investments, and motivated differently than the, than the multinational huge you know, uh, technology companies that have billions of dollars. I think in the startup um, category, startups should just really embrace Kubernetes for speeding the way they build reliable and scalable applications. I think really from the very beginning, Kubernetes is becoming kind of compelling and, and, and reasonable even at a very small scale like for you know, two or three node environment. Um, it's becoming very easy to run and install and manage. Of course, it gives you a lot of really great properties in terms of actually running, building your systems, adopting microservices, and scaling out your, your application. For, for the, and that's sort of like a direct end user um, uh, use case, startups, kind of building their business, building their stack on Kubernetes. We see companies building products on top of Kubernetes. You see a lot of them here on the expo floor. That's a different type of vendor startup ecosystem. I think there's lots of opportunities there. Um, the, for the big multinationals, I mean, I, th I think one um, really interesting thing that, that hasn't really quite been done yet is sort of treating Kubernetes as a first class citizen as opposed to a way to commercialize uh, and enter a new market. Um, I think one of the default ways large technology companies tend to look at something hyper growth like Kubernetes and TensorFlow and other projects is wrapping around it and commercializing in some way. And I think a, a, a deeper, more strategic path for large companies could be um, to really embed Kubernetes in the core kind of crown jewel IP assets that they have. Um, so I'll give you an example, like 
you know, for let's let's just take SAP. I'll just pick pick on SAP randomly and for no reason. This is one of the largest enterprise software companies in the world. I would I would I would encourage you know the, the co CEOs of SAP, for example. There's only one to, CEO now. Is there one it's CEO now? Okay. left. It's now. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I, have, I haven't been keeping up on the SAP <laughs> politics. But let's just say you know a CEO boardroom level discussion of you know replatforming the entire enterprise application stack on something like Kubernetes. Um, you know, could deliver a ton of really core meaningful benefits to their business. And I don't think like deep, super strategic investments like that at that level are being made quite yet. I think at a, at a certain point in time in the future that they'll probably start to be made that way. But that's how I would like look and, at and smart investments at the bigger scale. We're not seeing scale. scale yet with Kubernetes. Just the tip of the toe is in the water. I think so we're starting speak. to see scale, John. I think what we are. What is the scale number I'll give you the best it? example, which came up today and actually really surprised me, which I think was a super compelling example. Um, the largest retailer in China, so essentially the Amazon of China, uh, JD.com uh, is running uh, in production for years now at 20,000 uh, com compute nodes uh, with Kubernetes. And their largest cluster is a 5,000 node cluster. And so this is pushing the boundary of the sort of production yeah, readiness of Kubernetes. I think that might be the biggest one I've heard. Yeah, that's, that's certainly, I mean, for, for a disclosed user, that's pretty huge. We're starting to see people actually talk publicly about this, which is remarkable. Um, and there are huge deployments out there. We saw Tyler Jewell come on from WSO2. Yep. He's got a new thing called Ballerina. Yep. Yep. New programming language, have you seen that? Thoughts I have, on that? I have. What's your thoughts on that? You know, I think that, so, I won't make any particular specific comments on Ballerina. I'm, I'm not extremely informed on it. Um, I, I did play with it a little bit. I don't want to give, give any of my opinions, but what I'd say is, and I think Tyler actually mentioned this, um, one of the things that, that I believe is going to be a big deal in the, in the coming years is, so, uh, trying to think of Kubernetes as an implementation detail, as, as the kernel. Um, do you interact directly with that? Do you learn that interface directly? Are you sort of um, kind of optimizing your application to be sort of natively aware of, 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 of those abstractions? I, th I think the answer to all those questions is no, and Kubernetes is sort of delegated as a compiler target. Um, and so, fr frankly, yeah. like directionally speaking, I think what, 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 what uh, what Ballerina's sort of design is aspiring towards is, is the right one. Um, compile time abstraction for building distributed systems is, is, is probably the next logical progression. I like to think of, and I think Brendan Burns has started to talk about this over the last year or two, everyone's writing assembly code because we're swimming in YAML and, and, and configuration based you know, uh, 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 designs and, and systems. Um, you know, sort of uh, pseudo declarative but more imperative and static configurations. When in reality, you know, we shouldn't be writing these assembly artifacts. We should we should be delegating all of this complexity to a compiler, in the same way that you know we went from assembly to C to higher level languages. So I think over time that that starts to make a lot of sense, and we're going to see a lot of innovation here probably. What's your take on the community um, formation? Obviously, it's growing. So yep. Any observations and any insight for the folks watching? What's happening in the community? Patterns, trends you see, like, don't like. I think we could do a better job of reducing politics uh, amongst the really sort of senior um, community leaders, uh, particularly who have incentives, you know, behind behind their sort of you know agendas and and, and um, sort of uh, opinions, uh, since they work for various you know large and small companies. Yeah, who um, have a horse in this race? Sh sure, and and there's and there's you know whether they're perverse incentives or not, um, I think. Net, net, the project has such a high quality, genuine, like humble, focused group of people leading it that there isn't much pollution and, and negativity there, but I, th I think there could be a, a higher standard in some, in some cases. Um, since the project is so huge and there are so many um, very fast moving areas of, of evolution, there, ten there tends to be sort of a, a fast curve toward many cooks being in the kitchen um, when, you know, when new things materialize and I think that could be better, better handled. Um, but uh, pos positive side, I think like, the, the project is becoming incredibly diverse. I just get super excited to see Aparna from Google uh, you know, leading the project at Google, uh, both on the, the hosted uh, uh, SaaS offering and the, and the Kubernetes project. Um, uh, people like Liz and, and, and others. And I mean, I just think it's an awesome, welcoming, yeah. super diverse um, community and, and you know, uh, uh, you know, 
people should really highlight that more because it's a, I think it's a, it's a unique asset of the project. Well, you're involved in some deep history. It's, I think we were going to be looking at this as a moment where you know, there was once a KubeCon, KubeCon that was not part of the CNCF. Yeah, that's and, true. You know, you did the right thing, did a good thing. You could have kept it yourself and made some good cash. It's definitely gotten really big, <laughs> and uh, way beyond way beyond me now at this point. Yeah, so. those guys did a good job with CNCF. They, they're doing a phenomenal. I think m m vast majority of the credit at this scale goes to um, Chris Anisik and and um, uh, and Dan and Dan Kahn and the events team at the Linux Linux Foundation and CNCF, and obviously Kelsey and Liz and Michelle Nurali yeah. and many others. Uh, blood, blood, sweat, and tears. It's yeah. no small feat yeah. pulling off an event like this. You know. Uh, Corralling the CFP process, coordinating speakers, yeah. um, setting the themes—it's it's a really and huge. And now they got to deal with all the community licenses. Lauren, your thoughts? Well, they're they're consistent across Apache V2, I believe, is is what Dan said. So all the projects under the CNCF are consistently yeah. licensed. So I think that's great. I think they actually have it together there. Um, you know, I. I do share your concerns about the politics that are going on a little yep. bit back and forth at the high level. I, I tend to look back at history a little bit, and for those of us that remember JBoss and the JBoss fork, are you know we're a little bit nervous, yep. right? So I think that you know it's important to take a look at that and make sure that that doesn't happen. Also, you know, OpenStack and the stuff we've talked about before, which are different distros coming out, or too many distros going to be hitting the street yep. and. You know, how do we keep that you know, more narrow focus so that this can go across pro yeah, I, providers? Yeah, I, I, I started this, I, I, I like to list, list uh, rank, and iterate things. I, I started with this, this sheet of all the vendors, you know, all the Kubernetes vendors, and then um, Linux Foundation, or CNCF, took, took it over, and they've got a phenomenal sort of um, conformance testing and uh, sort, of, uh, com com sort of compliance versioning uh, sheet which lists all the vendors and certification status and updates and so on. And I think there's 50 or 60 companies. And I, on, on one hand, I think that's great because it's more innovation, lots of, lots of uh, service providers and, and, and offerings, but there is a concern that, that there might be some fragmentation. And, um, but again, this is a really big area of focus and I think it's, it's being addressed. Yeah, I, th I think yeah. the right ones will end up winning, yeah, right? For sure. and, and that's what's going to be key. Healthy competition. Yes. All right, final uh, question. Let's go around the horn. Uh, we'll start with you, JJ. Sure. Wrapping up. KubeCon 2018, your thoughts, summary, what's happened here, what will we talk about next year, about what happened this week in Denmark? I think this week in Denmark has been a huge turning point for the growth in Europe and the sort of proof that Kubernetes is on this like unstoppable inflection uh, growth curve. Um, I, you know, we, we usually see a smaller audience here in Europe relative to uh, you know, the domestic event be before it, and we're just see seeing the numbers get bigger and bigger. Um, I think looking back, we're also going to see just the quality of, of end users and the, the end user community and more production success stories starting to become front and center, which I think is really awesome. There's lots of vendors here, but I do believe we have a, a huge representation of end users and companies actually sharing what they're doing pragmatically and really changing their businesses from Financial Times to CERN and physics projects and you know, JD and, and other huge companies. Uh, I think that's just really awesome. That's a unique thing of the Kubernetes project. There's some hugely transformative um, companies doing awesome things out there. Yeah, Lauren, your thoughts, great. summary of the week from well, I think I think it's been awesome. There is so much innovation happening here, and I don't want to overuse that word because I think it's you know kind of BS at some point, but really these companies are doing new things and they're taking this to new levels. I think that hearing about you know the excitement of the folks that are coming here to actually learn about Kubernetes is phenomenal. Yep and they're going to bring that back into their companies and you're going to yep. see a lot more actually coming to Europe next year. Yep. Um, I also, true multi-cloud would be phenomenal. Yep. I would love that if you know you could actually glue those platforms together per se. That's, that's really what I'm looking for. But also security. I think security, there needs to be a security SIG. We talked to customers earlier. That's something they want to see. I think that yep. that needs to be something that's brought to the table. That's awesome. I mean, my view is uh, very simple. You know, I think they've done a good job in CNCF and Linux Foundation, the team, building the ecosystem, keeping the governance and the technical and the content piece separate. I think they did a good job of showing the, the future state that we'd like to get to, which is true multi-cloud, yep. workload portability, those things, still out of reach in my opinion, but they did a great job of keeping the tight core and to me, when I hear words like de facto standard, I think of major inflection points where industries have moved Absolutely. big time. You think of internetworking, you think of the web, you think of these moments where that small little tweak created massive new brands, 
and created a disruptor enabler yeah. that just created, changed the game. We saw Cisco come out of that movement of IP with routers, you're seeing you know, 3Com come out of that world. I think that, that this change, this new little nuance called Kubernetes is going to be absolutely a de facto standard. I think it's definitely an inflection point and you're going to see startups come up with new ideas really fast yeah. in a new way, in a new modern global architecture new startups, and they're gonna, I think people are going to be blown away. I think you're going to see you know, fast rise in growth companies. I think it's going to be an investment opportunity, whether it's token economics, or a venture-backed or private equity play. You're going to see people come out of the woodwork, real smart entrepreneurs. I think this is the, what people have been waiting for yeah. uh, in the industry. So, I mean, I'm just super excited. And so thanks for coming on. Thank you for everything you do for the community. I think you truly extract the signal from the noise. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see you keep coming to the show. So. Really Appreciate awesome. your support, and it's, sure. it's again with co-developing content in the open. Lauren, great to uh, host with you this week. Thank you, it's been and awesome. You got a great new venture. High five there. High five to the founder of KubeCon. Nice. This is the Cube, not to be confused with KubeCon. And we're the Cube, C U B E. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. It's a wrap of day two global coverage here exclusively for KubeCon 2018, CNCF, and the Linux Foundation. Thanks for watching. <laughs>